All right, so we're back. Uh, House of Ops and Military Affairs here on, on Thursday morning, not Tuesday. <laughs> um, and so what I'd like to do uh, is pick up where we left off, um, Tim, and um, I believe our next set of changes is uh, in Section 10. Thank you, Chair McCarthy. Yes, that is correct. Uh, again, for the record, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Counsel. And Section 10 appears um, halfway through page seven. And the first change I'd like to note uh, is that we, um, let's see, the reader assistant heading now reads, write in candidate registration and minimum thresholds in primary elections. Um, of significance, what has been added here is uh, added language to require that write-in voters receive the higher of 10% of the votes cast by the party plus one additional vote or um, the number of votes as the same number of votes that is as the number of signatures required for the candidate's office on a primary petition. And then if no Kate candidate is uh, determined um, to be the candidate of uh, party persistent to those two uh, minimums, um, then the candidate shall be nominated by the party committee in accordance with um, other statutory language, but I'll go into the specifics um, now. So the first additional language uh, appears highlighted in page eight under subsection B, specifically subdivision one, and then we add a subdivision two. And subsection B reads as follows, a write-in candidate shall not qualify as a primary winner unless the candidate A has complied with subsection A of this section and B receives the higher of I, 10% of votes cast by the party plus one additional vote, or I, I, a, sorry, the same number of votes as the number of signatures required for the candidate's office on a primary petition. S uh, subdivision two, if no candidate is determined to be the candidate of the party pursuant to subdivision one of the subsection, the candidate may be nominated by a party committee in accordance with subchapter two of this chapter. I'll pause there. So the total effect here is we have a writing consent form. So if, if you're going to be a, a candidate for a major party as a write-in, you file your consent form five o'clock the Friday before the by five o'clock the Friday before the Friday before. So that's the the first piece, and then you have to win the the higher of ten percent of the votes cast in that primary, or the if um, there for instance if there were only let's say two hundred votes cast in that primary, um, the minimum threshold is the number of signatures that you have to get to appear in that office. So for a legislative race, Tim, that's uh, 50 right now, right? For a, a house race. So you have to get the at least 50 votes. And if there were over 500 ballots cast, then it would be the 10%. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd agree with that. And <laughs> Does that part make sense to everybody? I know there's there's multiple multiple things there in that little section. All right. This um, I, this piece of the the threshold was the reason that I felt like it was H ninety seven was the appropriate vehicle. All right, Tim. Let's keep keep going. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see, the, that is the uh, last substantial um, uh, passage of changes. The, sorry, uh, body of uh, changes uh, to be made, but there are some other things i just like to point out as we kind of scroll down. Um, let's see, section 12 on page nine. Um, I apologize, this is uh, not highlighted, but in section uh, sorry, subdivision 2A now reads, um, a vote for a writing candidate shall be counted as a write-in vote that is without consent of candidate unless the write-in candidate filed a consent of candidate form with the Secretary of State in accordance with section 2370 of this title and the primary election subsection 2472B of this title for the general election in subsection 
1.02F of this title for the presidential primary. And I'll just pause there and say that um, this is a rephrasing of um, what had been there before, which was uh, replaced with the term generic right in vote um, to provide uh, more clarity and um, avoid ambiguous terminology. Moving on, if that's all right. Um, the next uh, change um, I'd like to point out is uh, we moved um, the um, election, uh, sorry, electronic ballot return uh, sections uh, to the end of the bill now amendment. And you'll find those in sections 15 and 16. Was there any change to the language from what we saw yesterday, Tim? Yes, there is one slight change. There's a highlight on page 13. And this is under the uh, return of ballots language in Title 17 VSA Section 253043, that is uh, subdivision 2A. And this clarifies that um, all ballots electronically delivered pursuant to um, uh, subsections 2539B or C, and again, that's for people, uh, voters with uh, illness or disability in B and military or foreign voters in, um, or abroad, uh, voters in C. And uh, those uh, electronically delivered ballots will be returned um, by means of a secure online portal developed and maintained by the Secretary of State, State and directly to the clerk before the close of business on the last day of the clerk's office. Um, is that the, on the last day that the clerk's office is open prior to the election. And uh, I'll pause there. That is the only new language um, in that section. We had talked about that uh, briefly yesterday. Anybody have any questions about the electronic returns language? Anything else we should know on this draft? Um, Representative? No, this is just a comment. Um, I certainly uh, can get behind the electronic uh, filing provision in this in this bill. I'm, I'm concerned with the rest of it. I, I just I want to make sure that there's an opportunity for this piece to definitely get through. And I, I just I don't know how we can work that. But um, uh, if I can go back to uh, comment on. Representative Hooper's scenario, um, as far as local elections go, <clears throat> I think a lot of times the folks that do get written in uh, maybe aren't there and they wouldn't have that opportunity uh, the day of um, or the day before uh, the actual meeting to, uh, you know, fill out a consent form. They may come back from vacation or wherever it is and say, hey, you know what, and I just, that, that wouldn't give them the opportunity to say yes, is my understanding, if they didn't fill out that consent form, correct? But that's right. So the way the way this is written now, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the way this is written now, you have to affirmatively file a consent form in order to have your votes counted. And for locals, it's by the close of the polls. In the scenario that you bring up representatively, uh, no. The, even a candidate who was written in but hadn't filed a consent form wouldn't, yeah, uh, yeah, wouldn't make it through. So that I know those are two separate things, but uh, uh, that's I, just my comments at this point. Yeah. All right. So uh, I want to open it up for uh, community discussion. Senator. Just <clears throat> quickly, if you might. Uh, remind me, what's our what's the timeline we're shooting for on this bill? I would like to vote this bill out tomorrow morning. That's why I, I'm spending significant time on it today. Sure. Um, and and moving to hearing folks' thoughts about each section of the bill. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, we're going to come back to this this afternoon, take it up tomorrow morning if it's. If we haven't come to a place where I feel like there's enough support for the sections, I'm willing to, to move. But we have 
a lot on our plate. Next yeah. week's going to be huge in terms of the public safety stuff that we have to consider, budget, um, and so yeah, no, I don't want to. I don't want to spend. Well, our the reason I asked is just because I I wouldn't support this bill as it sits right now. I can't. Um, I thought I could be open to the fusion changes, but I'm I'm not into it, and. Uh, rather it just get struck but that's probably not something that you want me to say so. um could you maybe elaborate on the things that you're thinking about well it just feels like we're meddling with a, a vermont tradition that uh, happens pretty rarely and this um there are cases in electoral history in this state where candidates were so popular that the other party wanted to express their support without being prompted. And this would remove that possibility entirely. And I'm not exactly sure why we need to do that. You know, so I know that you're making the argument that this bill would heighten the integrity of elections, but I think it would simultaneously, uh, place emphasis on, on partisan politics in the elections process. And um, I'm never going to support that concept. Is it specifically the need for a candidate to file a write-in consent that's, that's your concern? No, I mean, I thought that that was probably a reasonable thing. <laughs> what I'm saying is that you can't now, <clears throat> let's say, I'm popular enough in my district with the Republicans that they wanted to express that without being, without me having to like set it up that way. You know what I'm saying? That would no longer be allowed. I'm not saying that I'm so presumptuous, presumptuous as to expect that, but I'm saying that it's now not going to be possible if this, and I'm not, I'm not talking about my, I don't care about my race. I'm saying nobody can have that. And I also don't really care about the, the, the fighting between progressives and Democrats in Chittenden County. It's not, it's not something that I think this committee should be addressing, but that's I'm, obviously I'm- So I just wanna, before I go to Representative Norwicki, say that I have gone really out of my way to make sure that this bill's not about the fighting between Democrats and progressives in Chittenden County, including the provision that we spent some time on this morning about preserving the ability for candidates to say, you know, I want my write-in votes cast, or my, I want my uh, nomination votes cast toward whichever part me they want in order for major party status. So uh, this bill is not about that. For me, this bill from the beginning has been about, I want the party designation to mean something. And even if we're just raising the minimum threshold, like that, that to me is like one of the one of the key things. It was a key thing for the folks who sponsored it's ninety seven, which is to raise the threshold. Um, and the pieces around, you know, wanting to say that you should run for the party, you should pick a lane, you should run for the party that totally. you really want to identify with. So that I agree with this. Oh, sore loser part. Let's do that. Yeah, but but you know. So it really does the writing piece, the the piece where it that that seems to be the crux of of your concern, Representative Cooper, if I'm understanding, because that's the mechanism yeah. that's causing the problem that you're identifying, I think. I guess creating barriers to something that happens pretty rarely because you want to make certain that people are representing themselves accordingly when they seek public office, it just seems like a little bit of a disconnect. The context isn't... Okay. It doesn't line up well enough for me, I guess. Representative Logan. Yeah. Well, th thank you. And I don't mean, I, I appreciate Excuse me. you doing what you've done. Done? Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Um, so thank you for, for all the sharing. It's a good discussion. And you know, I, I keep going back to the, the Republican primary for Congress last year. And, and, it's hard to describe what it was because we haven't seen anything like that before. And I don't want to certainly open the door for more of that. But I don't think this stops anybody from voting 
for who they want to in the general election. We're talking about the primaries here. And if anyone from any party can vote for anyone once we get to the general election. So I don't see how that stops people from voting for you or for anyone. Done. <laughs> Representative Chasen and Representative Hooper. <laughs> I think one of the things that I'm hearing from this portion is that um, people can still uh, vote for somebody from Party A in Party B's primary, um, but this is asking that individual, the, the candidate, uh, to approve that they want that label. So um, in your example that you used, if, if um, the Republicans in your district wanted to vote for you on the Republican primary, um, they could do so, but in order for that to be published, you just have to say, yes, I want that label. Yeah, but you can still reject it. Like, I could still say, no, I'm not a Republican, so I'm not going to put that next to my name. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So this is, that doesn't... It doesn't solve that problem, if you would even call that a problem. Representative Cooper of Burlington. 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 I heard Burlington. Uh, <laughs> Representative Chase just said something that threw me off a bit, but never. <laughs> <laughs> The thing that, you know, I've had a problem with the designation of word candidate for a while. It has to be proactive. Uh, everything in the world is not proactive. Um, is there a reason specifically that we would not say that somebody that came back from the Himalayas on December 1st, or no, back primary land, couldn't proactively say I accept as opposed to having filed first. So I think that there's a or there's an inner relationship between two things that, that are in the bill. And what I'm coming to understand from this conversation is that the write-in portion, the writing consent portion, the requirement for writing consent and the consequential there are two, two big consequences of that. I've heard Representative Nugent uh, be very clear that she feels like the name that is written in by the voters should be reported. And then the consequence that you're bringing up, Representative Hooper, if I understand it right, I want to really make sure I understand what the committee's saying around this uh, before we come back this afternoon on this. What I'm hearing you say is that you really deeply believe that someone who is essentially by acclamation by the, the people of Vermont, the people of that in that primary, whichever election it is, where they come together and they say, we want Joe Smith to be the candidate here. Joe might be in the Himalayas, but he's, he's an eligible candidate because his residency, et cetera, he meets all the other requirements, you know, that he could accept the nomination for either the primary or even office. And the consequence of only recording and counting as, as valid the write-ins after a consent form, has, it, it, it causes both of those things to happen. And so what I'm hearing real heartburn with that write-in piece, that that's the real crux of both of these concerns. And I, I just want to say, like, I really am hearing it. Um, and I started this and, and was really supportive of that proposal from the clerks. I put that in my initial committee bill proposal because I really deeply believe that you should have to do something affirmative in order to be a candidate. And I'm, I'm hearing some deep feelings about democracy and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and about like what, what this process should be. And I want that conversation happening here. That's our job. When in our elections jurisdiction, what we do in GovOps is to really deeply think about when we're asking the Secretary of State and the clerks to administer elections in a particular way, going so far as to say for the major political parties, you, you Secretary of State's office and clerks are going to administer these parties' elections because you're the only ones who are really fairly qualified to do that. Um, 
how they do it matters to me all deeply. <laughs> and uh, I'm hearing some real concern from the committee about this. So I want to I want to think about it <laughs> and process that uh, and talk about it a little more this afternoon before we kind of decide where we're going with this bill. But I, I just, I really deeply hear it. So other thoughts, we've got a little time. Well, my concern to narrow it down is not the mechanics of it. It is the, oh crap moment that we open up the possibility for that in the back of my head now, there's this little dog barking that says, gee, don't go there. And, uh, I can't put a finger on. I mean, if Bruce Springsteen comes and lives in the state tomorrow, there's a good possibility he'd get written in for anything. Uh, but we would, under this, say no. Yeah, so um, the I think that that's valid, and I want to sort of think on how we could preserve many of the things we want in the bill and maybe sort of move past this particular piece uh, when we break for lunch. But I, I want to say that the oh crap moment we had in Franklin County that we talked about when I was really first pitching this bill was that somebody who got less than 5% of the write-ins, you know, and we have wide open primaries. Who knows whether those people, you know, whether they're Democrats, whether they just picked up a Democratic ballot to make sure that their friend or the candidate they supported was on there. That person ended up right after the primary had a you know, big major thing happen that made it so that both major parties that <laughs> he won the nominations didn't want him to be their candidate and there was absolutely nothing they could do about it. And at least raising the bar a little bit as we were doing in the, with the minimum threshold <laughs> increase would make it a, a little bit more meaningful to get that second nomination and wouldn't prohibit anybody, wouldn't prevent anybody from being on the general election ballot. So my key priority with this bill on, the, on those sections, the pieces about access, the return of ballots, um, to Representative Higley's point, if, if the miscellaneous bill goes down in flames, we'll have other elections bills that um, will come through and I'll make sure that that's a priority because that testimony we heard yesterday was very compelling. But yeah, Representative Cooper. Well, that example of Franklin County that you used also in the back of the mind uh, that continues to seem to me like party governance, not state dictate in terms of finding a solution. To it. Like party decides that a candidate no longer meets their qualifications. George Stephanopoulos or whatever his name was in New York. Uh, party should have a mechanism where they can meet and withdraw. So that would, so the challenge there, and I agree with you, I really deeply agree with that. The challenge there, though, is that we deeply care about, and I've heard of the committee discussion, we care about having open primaries. A lot of Vermonters really expect that. Didn't want to change that in this bill. And we deeply care about the will of the voters, right? And so if the voters said in the primary that that's the candidate they wanted, and then we allowed parties to second guess the voters after the primary, I think a lot of Vermonters would have real deep concern about that. I mean, even the, even the idea that um, Chair Dame brought up, of the chair of the GOP of having like what Connecticut has where there's sort of like a, a primary plus where you get sort of a check mark or like a, a, I don't know that Vermonters would feel good about us asking the Secretary of State to do that. So I come back to the place where the, the viable thing, and I think the where if we want to make some improvement is to just make the threshold higher. And that was the crux of H97. Representative Waters Evans. Yes. Have a comment. I, I have so many comments. I just don't Please. know which. We, we got a few minutes here before I take to comment on first. Which which lane are we driving in right now? <laughs> Tell me which. We're we're just talking about the whole bill, so. Oh, okay. Well, Please okay. go for it. How many minutes until lunch? Yeah. No, no, no. We, we've got uh, we got six minutes until we have a, a bill introduction yeah. on something completely different. I just, yeah. <laughs> I, my main point is this, or my main sort of struggle that I'm having is that I think. Like, especially yesterday when we were talking about military personnel overseas voting and 
people with disabilities being able to vote, you know, either remotely or electronically or, or in their own voting station. Those are the things I think that are important as far as elections are concerned, because in my mind, voting, elections, all of these things. Are, the, the whole point of having any laws surrounding it is to make it easier, more accessible and more fair and to encourage as many people as possible to vote and give them the access to those things and make it equitable, right? And so for me, a little bit of the struggle, and I think it's part, a little bit of the struggle is that I feel fundamentally con conflicted about placing any limits on any of these things at all, like more than what exists already. I, I, I'm not saying there's, I know, I just saw your eyebrows go like that. <laughs> we already, because we already have minimum thresholds for yes, yes, yes. nominating. I'm saying it's <laughs> I'm not saying we should just scrap this all together and have a fight for all. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is, I, I think if we're going to move in a direction, then we should move in a direction of making things easier for people to run for office, easier for people to vote for the people that they want to vote for and easier for and just have everything clear and more accessible you know what i mean because maybe it is a little confusing but i don't see or hear any confusion from voters about when they go to vote and they're like what is this why do i only get a primary ballot what i hear people say and when i see people write things in is um I know that this, I'm a Democrat, so I can only vote for Democrats in the primary, but I just want to write this person's name now because I want to use my voice. So if it's annoying for the town clerks, I'm sure if your voice is like, I want Justin Timberlake to be the secretary of state, super aggravating, right? I totally get it. But I was just saying earlier, and I would like to, to say officially that the town clerk in Charlotte is amazing and I understand <laughs> all the town clerks are awesome. None of us and ever want to anger no. our oh, yeah. I think we've had that very really clear. <laughs> Why are we having this conversation? Because it's not a town clerk issue. Because but clerks are in. The, the backbone. I understand completely the hard work and stuff, but I'm saying for me a little bit, it's like I'm a bus driver, but sometimes it's annoying when people get on a bus in the way that I don't like them to. And unfortunately, that's part of the job is being a bus driver, right? Is that like someone might walk up the stairs backwards. You, you know what, I, am I making a, yep, an analogy here, analogy. you understand? I think clerks so it's annoying as it is the for the town backwards. clerks to have to write down Justin Timberlake and then all the other members of NSYNC, that's part of <laughs> the job because it's part of our system. It's part of our, it's, it's, our democracy. You, you know what I'm saying? So that's why putting any restriction on those things. And I understand that these are only for state elections, correct? The, no, the, no, no, no. The write-in the write write provisions are, go, go, we have, that's why there are multiple sections. So I want to, yeah, that should be really clear. Okay. I, I, is I, that, I asked. Yeah, so the, the write-in consent form, we propose that to be the five o'clock Friday before the Friday before the yeah. election for presidential primary, primary, statewide primary, and general elections, and then day of for local elections. Yes. So that the proposal that's in front of us has that right and consent process for all of our elections as it's okay. written in the bill right now. So then that brings up the other problem, which is that the primary system, or, you know, these primary elections are party driven, right? So what I would say, what I would say more accurately focus. is that in law since, you know, for over a hundred years in Vermont, mm -hmm. the state has run the major parties primary elections because parties used to have caucuses where just the party insiders pick their candidates and then those were the candidates on the ballot. And I think we deeply value in modern electoral thinking and in, in modern American politics generally, um, the idea that the selectorate, the people who choose the candidates. I'm a deep poli sci nerd. The selectorate is big, right? We wanna have everybody who affiliates with a party, thinks about a party, and in Vermont, it's so open that really it's anybody who wants to vote in that party's primary that August gets to choose who the candidates are. Yes. I mean, that, we have it wide, wide, wide open. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and, and there's the inherent conflict, right? Which is that it's, uh, the primary is all about the parties, but at the same time, 
we want to keep it as loose party wise as pos like possible. And that's the tension, right? Between these two ideas, which is that it's inherently about what party are you, mm -hmm. but also restricting what party a person could be chosen as. And when we say things like, is this person, you know, actually a Democrat if they're running as a Democrat or whatever, that's not up to the party. In my mind, I think it's up to the person running and the people voting for them. Yeah, and I think, and I guess I would just ask before we, we move on and take a break from this. Yes. Given what's in the bill now, if we look at the, just raise the minimum threshold, that's still the voters deciding who the party nominee is in that party primary. There's nothing about that part has changed in this bill. It's still the voters. The only difference is, is that the person has to more of them. In, in order to automatically get a second nomination. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, I believe we're going to just take a break and we will come back to this after lunch. Awesome. I'm going to do some deep thinking and you all have given me a lot to think about. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're having fun here, representing students. <laughs> we're, deep, <laughs> we're deep. No, we're deep. No, no, no. We're deep. <laughs> we're deep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're deeply appreciative of the opportunity to cleanse our palate and think about something else. Uh, so, if you want to take a witness chair, um, Will and Tim uh, we invite you guys to come back. Uh, we're not going to talk about the elections bill uh, anymore until we come back at one. So, thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. So, we're going to breath. We've been doing some deep thinking about elections. And how do you think about climate? Yeah. Let's talk about a special fund. <laughs> we, we have been busy in House GovOps military affairs uh, and tried to get Representative Sims yesterday. I got stuck in traffic. There was a lot going on in Ways and Means, as there always is. Um, so really appreciate you being flexible and working with us on the schedule. Um, so Representative Sims, please tell us about H-105. <laughs> Thank you, Chair and Committee. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all. I'm Representative Sims from Orleans for Albany, Crestbury, Greensboro, Glover. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all talking about H-105, which is the act relating to Community Resilience and Disaster Mitigation Fund. And the purpose of the bill is to create the Community Resilience and Disaster Mitigation Fund to provide funding to municipalities for disaster mitigation and uh, community resilient infrastructure. So to kind of frame how I got to think about this, um, bring you back to this summer, I don't know if folks remember, there was like a week when we had um, really high heat uh, and you know there were there were warnings about uh, what to do to be to be safe during that time. And during that period, I went to the Vermont Department of Health's um, website that had a statewide map of all the cooling sites. And I looked at my region, the Northeast Kingdom. We've got 55 towns. Just take a minute to guess how many cooling sites you think might have been on that map for that region. The answer was none. Um, and you know th there were a few lakes listed. And as I was thinking about my like elderly neighbor who's wheelchair bound, I was like, well, I guess I could like figure out how to get them in the car and like drive them down through the sand, like into the water, but like um, doesn't really feel sufficient to take care of people. Um, and, and I'm really worried that we're not prepared um, for the impacts of extreme weather on our communities. And if we don't prepare now, we're gonna leave, especially our most vulnerable um, behind. So as you all know, climate change is a fundamental threat to our economy, our environment, and our way of life. Over the last 40 years, there have been large scale shifts in our weather, weather patterns, including a measurable increase in the number of catastrophic weather events. Um, our state is becoming warmer and hotter. And with those escalating um, weather extremes where we have record temperatures and record rainfall events, um, they are having increased impacts on um, property losses. So from 2010 to 2019, extreme weather caused $69 million in insured losses across Vermont, um, impacting about 12% of policy pairs. And our local municipalities are really the front lines of responding to these challenges. And although we have state and federal funding that is routinely made available to help communities after an event, 
to recover and respond to that disaster, there is no long-term consistent source of funds to support investments needed to prevent disasters from happening um, and mitigate the impacts of those disasters. So again, we're paying a lot now after the fact to clean up. We are not making available those resources up front to help plan. And so what this bill does is it establishes the Community Resilience and Disaster Mitigation Fund to award grants to municipalities to provide support for those disaster mitigation activities. So that might be slope stabilization, watershed restoration, drought mitigation, grid hardening, which I think many Vermonters can relate to who spent many days without power um, because of events that we've had this winter already. Um, or, you know, other other uh, activities that would re directly reduce um, you know, the risk to communities' lives and property and decrease costs associated with recovery from events. And so revenue for the fund would be generated by increasing the assessment on certain casualty insurance company premiums. The funding would be awarded to municipalities with priority for projects that use funding to match other grants, for projects that are in town hazard mitigation plans, and projects that are in communities that are identified as high on the municipal vulnerability index. So right now we're working hard to create this municipal vulnerability index, which will show which communities are at most risk, and that's where it stops. Right now we don't have a next step for those communities that are identifying as, as vulnerable. Um, and this bill seeks to address that. And you know, I, I do want to be clear that this, yes, has a cost, but there is also a cost to doing nothing. Making up present investments will decrease losses that would otherwise be largely paid by insurers um, and policyholders. And so you know, we're having a lot of conversations in this building about what Vermont can and should do to decrease our emissions. And I really support those conversations. Also think that it's essential that we work on resilience and adaptation. Even if we stop burning fossil fuels today, we will still experience more and more severe weather events. And we need to be planning for that now. And we must do it in a way that leaves no community behind. Um, you know, again, we can usually access FEMA dollars to clean up after a disaster. And we've had a flood resilient community program in the past help with flood mitigation, but just flood. And there's a lot of additional mitigation activities that um, our communities will benefit from investing in now. And so this provides this long term consistent source of funding to make sure that communities are um, helping to prevent disasters. So, you know, critical support, I think, especially to our most vulnerable um, in this time. And I know that you have like a lot of bills on your wall, although it sounds like maybe you need a distraction from some of those other bills. <laughs> so I might, you know. Your presence is <laughs> I, I can think of nothing more important than making sure that our communities are prepared for a change in climate that is here. Um, and I hope that you'll consider taking up this bill and I would be happy to answer any questions about it. Represent Byron, I have a quick question. I'm gonna go last. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I want to thank you for putting this in here. I, I, one of the, you know, the, the Global Warming Solutions Act had two parts to it, right? And this is one of the pieces was the being more prepared for the weather that is here and the severity of incoming weather over the years that will continue to be burdensome and uh, catastrophic. So, A, thank you for that. I, this is something I genuinely believe we need to start taking a harder look at. Um, my question for you in the, within the context of this, though, is um, could you just explain a little bit more in depth about the funding mechanism coming off the existing insurance yeah. market structure? Yeah, happy to dive into that. So um, the bill does include a one-time investment from our um, you know, one-time general fund surplus um, to sort of seed that fund. And then additional revenue would come from 32 VSA um, 8557, the Vermont Fire Service Training Council. And so that is a fund that is currently assessed on all um, insurance companies that write um, fire, homeowner, multiple peril, allied lines, farm owners, multiple, I mean, a, a sort of long list of sort of general, like catastrophic coverage. Yeah. And um, uh, the current assessment um, raises uh, 1.3 million and 1.2 of that goes to the fire safety special fund, um, which I believe provides um, education and training and support for um, fire services. And then 150,000 goes to the emergency medical services special fund. 
And what this bill does is it increases the assessment on those same insurance companies um, to generate uh, 4.3 million. So the 1.3 million would continue to go to the fire safety special fund and the EMS special fund. So those would stay as they are with their current allocation. And then the additional 3 million would go into a new community resilience disaster mitigation fund that would be used um, and made available uh, through grants to municipalities <coughs> to make those investments that would uh, mitigate disaster and ultimately reduce costs for insurance companies and insurers and policyholders. Okay. Um, no, no, no. That, that was very detailed, but I, I, I keep going. Um, so would that be, be sort of just like one of my overarching life philosophies is like plan for the worst, hope for the best, which is, I think, is a philosophy that needs to be applied in the overarching context of this. Um, do I have a last question to that? No, I'm going to stop and marry me. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. So Representative Sims, I understand the fund and what it's for, and I understand the funding mechanism you described, although if we were to take up this bill further, I'm sure that uh, it would come right up to your committee and you all would decide actually how to fund it. So I'm less concerned about the funding mechanism because that's not our wheelhouse yeah. here. I am wondering, um, who would decide how to spend the money that's in the fund? Yeah, so um, I, th I think we have a model. So um, we have had in the past um, with kind of one-time ARPA dollars, the Community Flood Resiliency Program, which was um, managed by uh, state, state Emergency Management. Um, <laughs> Division and so they stood up a fund. You can uh, there would be certain criteria. Communities would apply if you met that criteria. Uh, you know you would be eligible to be awarded a grant. And so I think we have you know within existing state government, um, you know agencies in place uh, with expertise managing funds around disaster mitigation, um, who would uh, stand up the program determine the eligibility, the application process, and, and award those funds. Again, my suggestions were that we prioritize projects that were leveraging other dollars, like other FEMA grants, um, were included in town hazard mitigation plans, and or um, had a high rating on the Municipal Vulnerability Index, uh, which is a tool that has been put together by the Climate Council. So. Um, you know, knowing that, you know, we could never fund everything, you know, try to prioritize the planning work that's already happening on the ground in all of our towns. Um, so I'd, I'll stop there. So we're going to hear next week about um, a more administrative uh, and committee setup issue with the regional emergency management committees that we uh, set up in the previous biennium. Um, and so I, I had wanted to think about them in the context of this do you have you thought about how they might interface in that process of figuring out yeah i think that's a great question for them i think there are a lot of partners who would have really great input about how to structure um, this work i think what i experience in my communities is um Often we have no shortage of uh, projects that we have identified as a need, and what we often lack are both the capacity to, you know, uh, apply for funds and manage those projects, and access to the resources. Um, you know, the, the reason my community isn't ready for severe weather isn't because we don't necessarily know what to do. It's that we lack the resources to do that. And, and I think there are lots of partners who have the expertise, who know what our community should be doing. I imagine, um, you know, the, the groups that you just mentioned uh, would be a part of that. Um, and, and this gives them a tool to actualize that we know we need to do now. Any other questions for Representative Sims? Representative Mowicki. This one share my support for this and I can relate to two years ago that summer when we had 18 inches of rain in July and one night in our town we had eight inches of rain biked up 13 roads including a bridge that wound up costing a half a million dollars to replace and uh, we still haven't received FEMA money we were promised two years later and and the other piece that happened that I think makes it easy to rationalize asking insurance companies is I was inundated with calls from people whose insurance companies turned down their claims to repair driveways, to repair culverts, to other storm-related damage. And um, 
I've lost count of how many storms of the century we've had already in this century. And uh, I think this is a realization of the, the reality we're in. And uh, this is going to help recognize that. And uh, I'm hoping we can support this. Thank you. Yeah, my, my small town is on its third million dollar bridge uh, on the same section of road. Um, and again, you know, really worried about what happens to Vermonters at the end of long dirt roads when they're without power for a week. Um, and, uh, you know, how we're making sure that there are places that people can go to stay warm or to stay cool when they need to. Um, and maybe even figuring out how to make sure that we're hardening our grid so it goes out less often. Representative Sims, thank you very much. I'll be thinking about this when we hear from the RMCs uh, next week. And um, I think we really do need to figure out how we make sure that communities have the capacity. We've already done a little bit of work on that with uh, our support for the uh, rural uh, municipal capacity grants in the BAA. And I think this is going to be the way that we do sure that our communities have access to the programs and resources that we create and whether we have enough resources for them to access is going to be a key question that keeps rolling forward. Um, so this is an important piece for us to be thinking about in our GovOps world here. So thank you very much for being with us today. Appreciate it. Yeah. Glad to provide a distraction from <laughs> uh, yeah, it was get out of the elections world. <laughs> get in our public safety world. <laughs> Thanks. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right, committee. Um, so that is uh, all we have on the agenda before lunch. I am going to um, have us all come back and um, we'll continue our work working on the elections bill. Um, and I am uh, working with a couple of folks uh, to try to come up with a way to thread the needle on the domestic violence fatality review um, recommendations. Um, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to um, put something before the committee, if not um, at the end of our session this afternoon before four tomorrow. Um, and with that, we will adjourn. Good afternoon. Uh, we're back at the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs, um, taking up, renewing our conversation with the latest and greatest draft of H97, our committee's elections bill. And uh, Tim Devlin is here uh, to walk us through the changes in draft number 1.2. Before he does that, um, I have heard loud and clear that many folks on our committee have trouble with the writing candidates provisions, uh, the writing consent form provisions. Uh, and some of the consequences that we talked about this morning around that. So this draft of the bill uh, has essentially two major changes. One is that it removes all of the write-in consent form requirement pieces. Um, so that's big change number one. And big change number two is that um, with the correspondence, some of the testimony that we had last week, um, the fix to on the campaign finance piece between candidates and parties, I think it's pretty clear that we want to put a cap on that uh, and just raise that cap to something that will still encourage candidates to file campaign contributions that are actually directly to them and have them show what they're um, filing to the party without going through a pack or doing another uh, legal end run that while a lot of the activity that we see is with the letter of the law, uh, it, it violates kind of the spirit of it. So those are the two big changes, and I'll have Tim walk us through the words on the page. Thank you very much, Chair McCarthy, and um, good afternoon, committee members. For the record, uh, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Counsel. The first, uh, sorry, before you, you have uh, draft 1.2 of the strike all amendment to H97. The first um, substantive change from what you were reviewing um, this morning um, occurs in on page three at the top. Again, I've highlighted anything that has been um, altered for the most part, except for omissions, which have been uh, removed and there's nothing to highlight. Just wanna note that. Um, so we have, this is in campaign finance limits for state candidates. Uh, this is at the, uh, 
bottom of page th two, just to orient everybody. Section four, um, amending Title 17 VSA, Section 2941A. Let's see, reads subsection A in any election, skipping some text to subdivision 5A, a political party shall not accept contributions totally more than, and I'll just skip down to the relevant part at the top of page three, which is highlighted. Um, let's see, subsection B, sorry, <coughs> subdivision B. A political party shall not accept contributions totally more than $100,000 from a candidate. I'll pause there. Seems pretty straightforward. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. And um, just like to note that the next section, um, which uh, pertains to minimum thresholds, uh, is now in section 10. The previous sections 10 through 14 were either removed in whole uh, or were removed in whole with the exception of um, the minimums. Uh, which now appear in section 10. And that can be found on page seven now. And I just like to make a quick note that the reader assistance heading um, on line four, um, I've made a note to modify that uh, so that it'll read just minimum thresholds and, or uh, write in minimum thresholds in primary elections, removing the candidate registration form. Uh, which is no longer strictly accurate. Um, section 10 uh, has uh, much the same language as uh, appears in H97, uh, Represent Representative Shai's uh, bill and reads essentially the same, but now is missing um, what was a new subdivision A1 and uh, I can just read through that if you'd like, uh, Chair McCarthy, or um, maybe pause for uh, um, either questions or direct it to um, uh, Director Senning to answer any, um, provide additional context or something like that. But I'd be happy to read that through now as well. I have a question. Representative Chase. Um, Tim, <laughs> am I reading this correctly? It's like a self-referential loop. A uh, write-in candidate shall not qualify as primary uh, winner unless the candidate has complied with subsection A of this section, oh. which is? Yes, I apologize. That's an oversight. That should be removed. Okay. Uh, does that mean everything just basically moves up one subcategory? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. So line 10 is, we just need to get rid of those by, yeah. Because mm. we removed this, the, yeah, we get, right. and then two months to one right. with the A, B, C sections. But the intent here is um, that we have the thresholds we discussed this morning, but absent all of the other language about needing to file a consent form. So we were. I'm only Can I ask a question, Mr. Chair, if we have one minute? Yeah, please. Of Tim, I noticed that sure. um, the second clause, which was existing language, is struck through. And I know it was in the draft before. I was going to raise this before. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to what I'm referring to. It's the stricken through language on lines 15 and 16 on page 7. Yes, that reads, except that if writing candidate receives more votes than a candidate whose name is printed on the ballot he or she may qualify as a primary winner, correct? Right. Okay. I don't recall discussion, Mr. Chair, about this language or um, it being requested to be taken out. I can tell you it operates um, such that in the case where there is a named candidate, typically the threshold for writing candidates becomes an issue when there's no named candidate on the ballot. Right because as you all are well aware, usually the named candidate gets well more votes than any write-in. 
Um, in cases where there's a named candidate on the ballot and the write-in does get more, I just call to the committee's attention whether they want to keep that language that in that case, the candidate would still prevail, the write-in candidate, even if not meeting that minimum threshold. Uh, yeah, I wasn't paying attention uh, as closely as your director sending to that particular piece, but I think we should remove the strike and keep the language. If a named candidate can't get as many votes as a writing candidate, uh, I think they duly deserve to be the winner. I did not understand that that was what we, we had done by striking that language. Uh, so even if they don't meet the minimum threshold, yes, Representative Chase. So an example would be if somebody was running for state rep, there was named candidate on the ballot, they got 20 votes. A write in got 30 votes. They're both below the threshold of 50, yes, or 51. Um, right. Then, in that case, the write in would get the nomination. Well, yes, have... exactly. And without such provision, as you can see, you'd be you'd be saying that the named candidate won with less votes. Okay. Very rare, but I have seen it happen before, and I've even seen it happen at your house rec level. Yeah, so on this section, uh, Tim, I think I, so unless the committee corrects me here, I think what we like would like to do is obviously make the correction on line 10, move everything up, and then um, we'll restore the line or so remove the strike on lines 14 through 16. Um, okay. If, if the named candidate loses to a write-in candidate, um, the I think the issue that I was trying to solve with the threshold is kind of moot. <laughs> that seems like a yeah. very unlikely, that seems like yeah. a very unlikely yeah. scenario, but you know, we've got to belt the suspenders with the law here. <laughs> Representative Waters, Evans, do you have a question? Just to clarify, so it, removing the strike would ensure that the person who gets the most vote is the winner. Correct. Got it. That's my understanding. Right, well, Will's giving you the thumbs up. All right. <laughs> Just wanted to be sure. Okay. Um, questions about the words on the page for the, these two sections that have changed. It's a new um, How does this affect the write in votes that are? like recorded or not, is that? So by removing all of those provisions that we had had in the bill, mm -hmm. we're dispensing with the idea that I believe was the most uh, subject of most of our conversation this morning, which so now with this version of the bill, that entire idea mm -hmm. of a consent form for a writing candidate um, being a qualifying event is gone. Um, the consequences that we talked about of the removing the, the possibility that someone who didn't file to be a candidate, that's gone out of the bill. So everything reverts back to normal sort of today, underlying statute in this version uh, as it relates to write-ins, except um, if, uh, the the threshold is higher as it was in H97. And the only modification I would say, Tim, in H97, I believe all it did was move it so that the threshold went from half of the petition signatures to the full number. And I've added this additional idea uh, largely because of what happened in the Franklin County, County elections this past primary of saying the higher of 10% of the ballots cast in that primary or the signature threshold. So in a lot of our like legislative primaries down at our level, some of the party ballots, you know, I think there's usually just a couple or three or 400. So 10% for a lot of us, it, it, 50 is actually higher than 10%. Mm -hmm. um, but countywide, uh, when we do, when we see write-ins, those are often less than 10%. And um, one of my, key principles that I'm uh, trying to really focus on here is this idea that it should really mean something when you, <laughs> when you get that nomination, especially if it's, you know, the, or your second nomination. So you've named yourself on the ballot, you know, you've declared sort of who you are, what you affiliate with, you win that primary, and you're looking for that second nod. 
um, absent the, the party itself, party committee, et cetera, nominating you because there's a vacancy, um, yeah, you would really, um, I, I think we want to have a higher threshold based on what I've seen in our recent elections. So, um, so yeah, that was a long winded way of saying we took all that stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> But, Mr. Chair, can I add just a little more wind to that long wind? Yes, I promise. I promise it's really short. <laughs> just, just because of the, the nature of Representative Evans' question was, you know, what does it do to write-ins? I just want to make clear what the status quo is. You're right. We've, we've taken everything out related to that that brings us back to the current status quo. And that is that the clerks and the local election officials will now continue to be required to write the names and the vote totals of every person written in on every race at every point in the process, their tally sheet, their summary sheet, their election night reporting, and their official return of vote. The only exceptions to that are deceased and fictional characters that are recorded as blank. Fictional characters that takes care of the bugs money, actually. Yeah. yeah. Emails. So, so Will, right now as it is, names that even appear to be a real person would be reported, but names that are obviously a cartoon character or something to that effect are accounted as blank. Your Mickey Mouse's and your Abraham Lincoln's, but exactly a name you don't recognize, but appears to be a real live person every other cases. Recorded and reported. What about like a Hulk Hogan, which is basically <clears throat> a character and in no way, shape, or form, obviously a resident of a district? I, that's a judgment call of the clerk. I would say, well, Hulk Hogan to me is a real person. I'd say, look. Is it a stage name? <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. I just, this one tweaks me out of that. Stage name? John Wayne. Cease. Claire, the uh, Hulk Hogan's name is Terry Jean Bollet. I told you it was a stage name. I told you it was a stage name. Um, Representative Chase, I have to ask, did you know that or did you Google it? No, he just Googled it. Okay, all right. That's, that's, that's IT working overtime over there. I just had to ask. Okay. Next time we do that, don't just want to give me a sip of something. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> John Loops. Okay. All right. Um, so any further questions about these changes? Because what I'd like to do um, is just take a brisk walk through with Tim, just to remind folks of what sections are still in this draft that we didn't change since the last draft, but I just want us to holistically look at the, the thing in total um, and walk through it together. So um, Tim, would you guide us on a tour of what is left in draft number 1.2? Yes, I'd be happy to. And just for clarification, uh, a line by line walkthrough, correct? Yes. More, more we, yes. Let's let's do a line by line. We don't need to. So what I would say is we can do more more of a paragraph by paragraph <laughs> than a, than a, a line by line and stuff that we've been over today. So it, it can it can be. Uh, uh, we don't need to read every word that's on the page, okay. but if I, I want to have the committee sort of look at each piece, sit with it, understand that that, that piece that we've looked at in various versions, are just, <clears throat> I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that in a bill that we've been updating and making some edits and compromises on, sometimes it can <clears throat> sort of get lost which pieces are left in the draft, and I don't want anybody to accuse me of sort of sliding something in uh, at the last minute. I think that we, other than the piece we did yesterday on electronic uh, returns, um, which seemed to be a consensus piece, we've been whittling away at the sections primarily. Representative Cooper. How quickly do you think we can get Barbara Murphy to testify? You know what? I was just about to find a way. For the love of God, I was thinking the same thing. So, <laughs> do you want to? All right, so. Uh, She's like a John Rogers. Here's, here's what I would like. Uh, let's pause for just a, a moment on that, and Representative Hooper. Um, I have been asked by by several folks to testify or get the um, 
voice of an independent to talk about the movement of the independent filing deadline up. Um, I am hesitant to have sitting members come and testify and grow this committee uh, um, because pretty soon we'd have 150 people working on our bill and that's not how we do business in the state house. I also think it's valuable to have that perspective. So I've reached out to a couple of independent candidates, uh, haven't gotten availability. Um, and this is something that came up uh, this week and haven't been able to uh, find anybody. But Barbara Murphy, uh, rep former Representative Murphy, would be a great voice to add to our conversation. Um, and uh, I believe, uh, Andrew, that her I think I have her contact information. I'll try to send it to you now. So, um, so Representative Hooper, that's a great suggestion. I will forward some contact info to Andrea, and Sweet. she will do her magic. <laughs> yeah, if she could come in today or tomorrow morning, that would be lovely. Um, today. Okay. Um, Tim, are you still scheduled in Senate GovOps? I don't want to keep you here. Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, let me pull up that schedule. I think what we could do is take a break. I have about 30 things that I need to do. I'm sure other representatives do too. Um, and we could reconvene to just do a, a orientation section by section when you're done in Senate GovOps before we have to go to floor. Okay. And um, let's see, I should be in seven go Senate GovOps. Uh, 215 to 245, but knowing that they always, uh, they tend <laughs> to run a little delayed, um, I'd say maybe three o'clock, 315. Okay, we'll be on the floor. Sure. We'll be on the floor. So, um, I think what I'll do is, is give the committee a break. Floor is gonna be really short. Um, so we'll um, come back with you uh, for maybe half an hour at approximately 345 after we're off the floor. Tim, will that yes, work that for your schedule? Okay. All right, that'll give me time to look for the independent voice that we desperately need in this conversation. Uh, and make sure that we are working on um, another piece. So Tim, I'll let you go. Will, I'll let you go. Thank you both so much for the time today. Um, committee, one more thing before we break. Um, I am working with stakeholders to try to find a path on the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Commission language. Um, we've heard some very strong opinions around the category A versus category B issue. Uh, law enforcement has a perspective. The, the network for the prevention of domestic and sexual violence has a perspective. Attorney General has a perspective. I uh, would really like to try to move that, um, and but I think it needs at least a couple more days. I had that on the schedule for tomorrow. I just wanted to let folks know stakeholders are talking, uh, and I'm hoping that we can move that next week, but that will not be on our schedule tomorrow. So just wanted to let the committee know that we're trying to work through, um, trying to get the stakeholders to come to a place where everybody feels good, and um, it's an important issue and I don't want to lose it, but I also want to try to find a consensus path if we can. So just didn't want anybody to be surprised by that. Representative Pango. So is tomorrow's schedule then the elections bill at 8.30 in the morning, then the floor, then we're not going to hear about anything, um, the changes to law enforcement officer training? That's that's right. We're not going to okay. we're not going to do that piece tomorrow. That's exactly it. Okay. Yeah, gonna, try to find the common grounds before we get back on it as a committee. <laughs> so then we still do have to meet at 8.30 tomorrow morning is uh, my question. Uh, I will figure that out while we're on break. Okay. And if I can make it later, I absolutely will. But I'm cognizant of the fact that we have a fun field trip to our state archives <laughs> tomorrow afternoon. We'll make sure we get our work done uh, in advance of that. Um, and I know Andrew has been looking at the logistics of how we're going to get there. So <laughs> do you have any uh, news for that's fit to print yet from our Senate colleagues? <laughs> it's in Middlesex. Give an email. I will be coming back here. So I am willing to take 
me plus three, so uh, a third of the committee could go in my ride. Um, I can get a ride back here. It's in Middlesex? Because I would probably just, unless we had some dude back here, I'd probably, because that's already, mm. yeah, that, true. we yeah. had the right we'll ride back after that. Tomorrow, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, to work. So I'm <laughs> not coming back. So there. who would drive themselves and then continue north? Okay. <laughs> sure. Okay. But that's I'm right. indifferent. Okay. So it sounds like I'm the only southerner, aren't I? It sounds like if we had two two volunteer oh. drivers, we would get everybody who's not you know, and, and maybe just one based on those numbers. So all right. Well I think um I'm happy to take someone. Yeah, so I'm happy to take folks too. So I think we'll be able to figure this out easily because most oh, folks right. are headed in that direction. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's kind of Andrew. <laughs> well, uh, all right. Straight. 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 Not enough. <laughs> okay, great. Well, uh, we'll take a break.